through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 236. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Oz the Great and Powerful, mm-hmm. this March 8th, yes. it's Friday, March 8th, we're going to be talking about James Franco. Woo! Uh, interesting, relatively, I mean, I guess you would say a relatively newcomer. I mean, he's yeah. been around for a little over a decade, 15 years or so, yeah. which is the relatively new-ish. Yeah. He's, I would say he's like our contemporary-ish. Mm, How about that? Yeah. Throw that out there. I would say he has been around just long enough for teenage girls not to ever know he didn't exist. Mm. <laughs> All right, good enough. I'll go with that. That's one way to put it. Yeah, yeah. A bunch of different wide variety of stuff. Yeah. Some very comedic, some very serious, you know, yes. definitely some action oriented. Mm-hmm. Very, very wide spectrum of work he's done. So yes. uh, that's all good. I want to give a shout out to him. Uh, birthday buddy. Ah, born on nice. April 19th as well. So, James Franco, this one's for you. Another Aries? Yeah, exactly. We, we Aries stick together. Yeah. Represent. <laughs> well, the obvious place we're going to start by talking about him is Freaks and Geeks. Yes. This is the TV series that Judd Apatow produced, mm-hmm. which had, you know, James Franco, yes. Jason Segel, Seth Rogen, Rogen Linda Cardellini, mm-hmm. any number. Bio people. Phillips. Just, Martin Starr. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it had so Star. many. So Sean many. Francis Daly. Yeah. Any. Things, yeah. I mean, everyone out of that show has gone on to bigger. And I mean, even things. Judd Apatow was not much of a name at this time. I mean, Paul Feig was, but this really, I think, gave him a lot of his behind the camera chops too. Yeah. No. It's kind of amazing to think about how much talent there were yeah. working on this, and yet how screwed like, it was by the network. <laughs> I mean, screwed by the network, but just never really was able to find its niche at that time. Which is interesting. I mean, this show totally. Uh, Every episode, with the exception of the pilot, they filmed to not have a standard happy ending. And the only reason that they filmed the pilot to do it was because in case the show didn't get picked up, they wanted it to be able to have some kind of resolution. And they knew it was doomed as it was being filmed. They actually filmed the last episode, like, in production order, like, five or six episodes before when it actually happened. Mm. Because they were worried about cancellation happening and they wanted to make it. I mean, it was a definitely a different time in terms of television. Oh, God, I mean, you yeah. You think about, like, the things that were hugely popular at the time. This is 99. We're talking, like... Seinfeld, Friends. I think Seinfeld just ended oh, yeah, in, like, probably. 98 or so. But that was that was popular. Yeah. Friends was really popular. I mean, ER was mm-hmm. really popular. And I would say, for the most part, I mean... They're much more conservative in terms of the stuff they would do. You'd either be like a comedy or you'd yes, be a drama, and this true. sort of fluctuated between the two. I mean, it was and the hour-long, like the hour-long continuity-based series had not got the the oomph and steam it now has in network television. I don't even know if I'd say it's gotten a lot of steam in network television. I think I think it's still really Cable. relegated to half hour and stuff. I mean, it's tough to find a lot of like sort of. But you got your like you know you got your like. But regardless of what, like, if it's a comedy or not, you have your things like Battlestar Galactica, Breaking Bad, and Mad Men, and all these shows that have come out now that are all about building these long, complicated stories and having characters. And I think at the time, a lot of that was lost. It was more regulated to the, like, 30-minute boom, in and out kind of thing. Yeah, no, you're right right about the continuing of the the storyline past one episode. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But, like, I mean, even though still are very formulaic in a lot of ways. Oh, definitely. Whereas, I mean... You think about, like, most comedies, like Seinfeld and Friends, were really sort of... I mean, there was a little bit of build-up over the course of Friends, but not no, really yeah. Seinfeld. I mean, very yeah. little, like it's very much like... The show about the nothing. The slate is <laughs> wiped clean after each mm-hmm. episode, and for a comedy to sort of build on that. And it was... I don't even know if describing this as a comedy is really necessarily the best way to go, because, I mean, sure, there was comedy in it, but yeah. I don't think it was funny enough to be seen as a comedy yeah. or necessarily dramatic enough to be I, seen as a Yeah, drama. I think more like a high school show is mm-hmm. almost probably more realistic, which is makes sense because nearly everything that happens to the characters in the show happened to Paul Feig or other members of the crew. For example, the blue suit that Sam wears, the showering in the locker room storyline, mm-hmm. like those things all happened to people that made the that made the film. I made the show. And I also find it really interesting because, you know, it's one of those shows that has a pretty good, I think, authentic looking mm. time period, I think, authentic looking sets. Well, the pilot was filmed in an actual school. They mm-hmm. found an actual school. And then after the show got picked up, they made exact duplicates of the entire, on a soundstage of the entire school scenes. Like they, And then the rest of the series, they just filmed on those sets. 
I mean, it's it's interesting to think about. It. I mean, we we think about it in the sense that it, it was not a success, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I mean, it was nominated for the Emmy for outstanding writing for a comedy series, uh, for the pilot, mm-hmm. and I believe the next year for Discos and Dragons. That's the finale. But Such a good episode. It did win outstanding casting for a comedy series, which wow. makes total sense, mm-hmm. especially looking back now. But like at the yeah. time, like. To, to award Seriously. it for a bunch of people who, at the time, you didn't know what they were going to yeah. go on to do I mean, was pretty impressive. I think it was pretty clear at this time that all those people were very talented. And that's what gave Apatow so much credibility going forward, is that he had this just eye for like grabbing the right people. It's on, I mean, I, th- I think this is still, the show is considered like in the top 25 of like best cult sh- TV shows that oh, exist out there. Like, it's easily. funny to see people like the the mom, uh, mm-hmm. Jean Weir, Becky Ann Baker is now on like Girls yep. and stuff like yep. that. So in a very dramatically different mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. but, but still playing a mom. So it's, I mean, it's still a very, a very fun yes. show. And yeah. I, I mean, it, and it's I, got a, uh, what's his name? Uh, who played the guidance counselor? Gruber. Yeah, Dave Gruber, Gotta who we look. interviewed him on this very nice. Podcast. Yeah, super nice guy. He's, he's great. He's nice so guy. funny. It's kind of funny to think though that you go from such humble beginnings and just a few years later he was in Spider-Man. Yeah. I mean, between this, between Freaks and Geeks and Spider-Man, he did uh, like a James Dean TV mm-hmm. movie, uh, whatever it takes. Yeah. <laughs> which was before Freaks and Geeks. And, yeah. Uh, like a few other things, never been kissed. Yeah. Like, but really, not any hugely. Yeah. Many and he girls. just leaps from this show that, while it got some notoriety, was obviously not popular with the with the audiences at the time it was out, and then he just leaps into a franchise that, like the X-Men series, pretty much made the comic book movies popular. Yeah, I would say it was definitely those two that... Or, I would say X-Men made it popular and Spider-Man solidified it yes. by being so successful. Spider-Man really took the special effects and said, look, you can make a, sp- a sp- uh, Spider-Man movie. I think I think it was really interesting, though, because this is one of those ones for a long time that seemed to be unproducible or oh, unfilmable. Yeah. I like, think until 80, since 86 they were working on trying, trying to make to it. Get so it, yeah. many people, like James Cameron was attached to it for like 10 years or something. And they and just all couldn't these get people. it done. And yeah. yet, finally, Sam Raimi steps in and you know, knocks it out. Great cast. I mean, you have people like... Um, Toby Maguire mm-hmm. and Willem Dafoe, which are really, really well uh, cast oh, in their yeah. roles. But it's it's interesting to sort of see you know smaller people like Kirsten Dunst and James Franco sort of given these opportunities. Mm-hmm. And granted, like I'm not the biggest Kirsten Dunst fan. I know Neither a lot of people are. Like she's fine. Yeah. Like she's fine. Yeah. I prefer um, uh, Emma. Stone oh, Emma Stone. Yeah. As Gwen, Gwen Stacy. But yeah. you know, it's it's fine. I mean, the list of people that were also up for uh, I was looking at this list last night, and the list of people that were up for Mary Jane, mm. you know, really in the list, it was like Mina Savari and like Alicia Witt and like and like uh, Alicia Nobody Cuthbert would have been and like Eliza Dushku, and it was like okay. You know, maybe some of those people were like more lookers, but I don't necessarily think any of those other four actors are, Do are better, better actresses no. than Kirsten Dunn. And Kirsten Dunn isn't great in this movie, She's but fine. but I mean, she I, overall I think is probably a better actress her, than that rest of that list. I mean, I think it's a very limited role to begin with. To be honest, like it's not, none of the films and really give her much. Especially to work in with. the first one, you've got to just basically be that character so later it can turn into something. I actually think like this is probably the one where they actually give her the most material to work with because Which is you sad, know because it's the one where she's got the crappy wig rather than dyeing her hair like <laughs> but, the later ones. <laughs> but like, you know, she she has like the shitty boyfriend yes. and she sort of, you, you sort of introduce her living next to mm-hmm. Peter or yeah. like they're going to high school together. Like I feel like there's a little bit more after that it's really just like, I love you. You yeah. love me. You're going to change. Why are you never there <laughs> oh for me? Oh my god, Peter. Yeah. What Spider-Man saved me? Yeah. You're never there for me, Peter. Why but, can't you But James there? Franco is great as um, Harry Osborn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, which is, I mean, the Osborns is a great, the whole Green Goblin Hobgoblin storyline is a great Spider-Man arc in general, and so having that father-son dynamic is really interesting. And I think he played like that. That's an interesting character. You have somebody who's friends with a superhero, who the superhero's actual superhero persona is—he's a villain. I would argue that him. they probably have the best uh, storyline as the series goes on because yeah. you know, oh, the first yeah. one they're friends. Mm-hmm. The second one, um, he. He, I mean, he falls out with them, yeah. I think. Yeah, the kind at odds, yeah. And then the third one, like, he wants to flat out kill him, mm-hmm. but then they have to sort of, like, you know, join forces yes. to save the day. Like, I feel like they probably are the more interesting uh, relationship arc yeah. in the series. And so, Something that I find fascinating, because it's one of those movies that was really, like, over... Not overdone, but, like, really heavily special effects, and it was mm. like, it could be popular because the special effects were so good. You know that scene where Peter Parker catches all everything on the tray? Yes. It's not CGI. 
He actually just had sticky substance to hold the tray on his hand, and they just did it many, many, many takes till he actually caught those all on his own. Wow. <laughs> Way to go, Tobey Maguire, right? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's funny to think that it was like an Oscar nominee for the sound. Wow, really? Visual effects. I mean, I guess those make sense. Sound and visual effects, man. It's really well only, As we said, only yeah. ever remembered when they're done bad. <laughs> but, I mean, beyond that, like, it really didn't have anything too notable. Other than just killing it in the box office. He got nominated for a Grammy Award for Danny Elfman for score, <laughs> which is interesting. So, Danny like, Elfman, man. Great, great, talented guy. But, yeah, like... Uh, Nominated for Online Film Critics Society for Visual Effects. Hmm. Uh, winner for Favorite Motion Picture at the People's Choice Awards, which kind of makes sense because it was so um, successful. Yeah, immensely crowd I, mean, popular. I think it made like $100 million or something. Yeah, some opening rid weekend. Ridiculous yeah. amount of money. But it's, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's a fun series. I mean, it is. Obviously, it really trailed off for me by the third one. Okay, so it made $150 million opening weekend. Jesus. Which and its is, budget was what, 100? 139. <laughs> God yeah, damn. but I mean, I, I was never the biggest Spider-Man fan, so I, I mean, I enjoyed it. It definitely turned me around quite a bit on Spider-Man. I think I, I having think, Sam Raimi as a director was an interesting choice. Yeah, I, this is one of those franchises that I always feel bad for because I think I give too much hindsight flack to one and two because of how upsetting three was. Mm. Like it's just hard for me after seeing three to separate all those actors and characters sure. when I go back and watch one and two. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, it's like you know, at the time Spider Man came out, like everybody loved it. Like no one. Yeah, no. It was, I mean, it, no it, one was like, oh, it's a really bad interpretation of Spider Man. Like it, it blew studio and people's minds of like, oh wow, like special effects, well, I, you can do a really good I think, superhero I mean, movie. I think X Men sort of reinvigorated the comic book franchise, mm -hmm. but this is the one that everyone's like putting a million productions yeah. together after it, because it made $150 million, which was a record at that time. So crazy. So everyone's like, where's our comic book movie? Mm -hmm. Put it into action. Yep. That's why we started getting flooded with comic mm -hmm. book movies ever since then. So Definitely. Good time. We're going to jump forward a ways, though, to yeah. later on in the dec decade and mm -hmm. talk about Pineapple Express. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is the reteaming of Seth Rogen yes. and James Franco in a sort of, I don't know, action, adventure, comedy. Stoner buddy comedy. Yeah. Stoner, stoner buddy comedy. Yeah, we're good. in Washington. We can. We yeah, can, we can it's legal here. <laughs> it's legal to say that here. But uh, yeah, it's a, a, a process server and his pot dealer who go on the yes. lam after the process server played by Seth Rogen witnesses mm -hmm. a murder and they proceed to have those drug dealers murder, coming after him. Murder by Gary Cole, voice of uh, Harvey Birdman and Lumberg from Office Space. Yeah. Uh, I think it's interesting that in, it wasn't until the table read for this movie that uh, Seth Rogen and James Franco switched roles. Because originally, really? he Whoa. was going to play the drug dealer character, and James Franco was going to play the process server. And then during the table read, he was like, you know what, you're a lot more, a lot funnier with this, let's switch it up. I mean, it makes total sense. Though. I mean, I think Seth, or sorry, um, James Franco plays the stoner Mm -hmm. So much more than like Seth Rogen. <laughs> Not to say Seth Rogen can't play a stoner; yeah. he's perfectly fine at it. But like, I think James Franco has that goofiness element to his. At least and he just his... looks. <laughs> like I'm not, I don't want to prejudge him or anything, but he just looks like a guy who would be a stoner. I think it's interesting. Like you know, this is clearly like a pet project of Seth Rogen's, and and yes, he wrote it. Yeah, and. It, I think it's interesting to see how much James Franco got into this movie because, like, for example, the whole part about Saul having a grandmother, mm. that was something James Franco came up with because he thought it would be funny to have a drug dealer character who had a booby, <laughs> which it is. Yeah, it so, is. Well done. And then equally as, like, getting into that role, uh, while filming the scene in which Saul runs into the tree, James Franco became so overzealous that he actually ran into the tree and had to get stitches. Wow. <laughs> So Take like, dude, serious. dude, seriously, was getting into the role. Like, <laughs> I mean, it, it, I, it definitely shows how much uh, power Judd Apatow had got oh, at yeah. this point. I mean, Seth Rogen too, that they're able to get this film produced. I mean, mm -hmm. this is obviously post, you know, Forty Year Old Virgin yes. and um, Knocked Up, Knocked Up, and mm -hmm. was it? Um, was it? A oh God, Jonah Hill one. Brain, Brain. Oh, super bad, super bad. Thank yeah. you. So, you, I mean, all that had already hit at this mm -hmm. point, and so it was sort of like finally going back to sort of those classic things. I mean, it's, 
I, I, James Franco is a very funny guy. Yeah. So it was, <laughs> it was really good funny. to see him sort of go back. And this is like it's funny to think about. You talk about like the characters. Like this is very reminiscent in a lot of ways of the character he played in Freaks and Geeks. Yes. Like very much that same sort of stoner guy. Mm-hmm. Like very much sort of a return to his roots with yeah. that. Which which is really fun to see him and Seth Rogen just kind of dope dope around with those characters. But as I recall, like I think was it Tropic Thunder and mm. Sex Drive and this all came out right around the same time. Hmm. And you know it seemed like everyone was getting into a different camp in terms of which one was their favorite. Mm. For me, like I like this one. I think it might have been my least favorite of the three, though. Hmm. I really like Sex Drive. I don't think I've seen I thought Sex Drive. Tropic Thunder was pretty funny. Tropic Thunder and was great. And then I put this one on the bottom. Not to say this one was bad, mm. but like it's it's funny, but it it has moments where it feels like it's trying too hard too, hmm. which I feel like is something that's become much more common with Seth Rogen and Judd Apatow I, as their careers. I would agree with that latter blown point, yes. up. And as they're trying to like sustain that success, yeah. it feels like they're forcing it a little bit more I, I, than those other I films. would argue that this is maybe still on the upturn of that curve. Oh, I agree. Uh, oh, I, agree. I would agree with that. And I, I think this movie probably was one of the... It's surprising to see such a goofy comedy actually care so much about its action. But the action in this movie, while obviously silly and comedic, I think was really... Like, entertainingly well done. I remember being really surprised at how action it was as a film. And I was, I really enjoyed this movie. It was, I would thought it was really going to be like another Harold and Kumar, Cheech and Chong, like just dopey, goofy, half baked. And it turned out to be actually, I think, in the latter well, half of the movie, for or third act, pretty, pretty fun. Think about this James Franco was actually nominated for a Golden Globe for this film for best performance by an actor in a musical or comedy. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, that really adds credence to how yeah. much people enjoy that performance. Yeah. So, bravo, James Franco. Mm-hmm. That definitely deserves a lot of credit. It's funny, though, you know, the same year. Yeah. Not even a not even different year. Yeah. The same year, he was in Milk. Mm-hmm. We talked about Milk for, like, I believe it was Sean Penn. I, uh, think, I think we Josh talked about Brolin. Josh Brolin, yeah. too. Like, I mean, we, we've talked about it on several occasions mm-hmm. because it's a very, oh, very yeah. amazing film. I mean, on a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. This is obviously the story of Harvey Milk. Mm-hmm. Um, James Franco, though, is involved in the early portion of the film where he's Harvey Milk's lover in the early yes. days when he's in, like, was it New York and moving to mm-hmm. San Francisco, I believe. You know who was originally up for the, that role as who? well? Chris Evans. Really? Yeah. Captain America. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I think Chris Evans would have been perfectly fine, I mean, I think he could have done it. It's not yeah. like I don't think he could, but it's just one of those things that, you know, sometimes you just get that mental image mm-hmm. in your head. You're like, that seems very strange. I mean, there's definitely an element of, like, sort of, like, the hippie that... Mm-hmm. James Franco yeah. very much can embrace, yeah, which I can, beatnik element. Which it's is easier why he later goes on to be in Howl. Yeah, easy to see him doing. Easier to see him doing that than Chris Evans. But unlike you know when we're talking Spider Man and Mary Jane, like I could see them being swapped and not yeah. necessarily like a huge yeah. dramatic change. I think both of them are pretty serious about mm-hmm. their acting and are, are pretty talented guys. So this, I, this movie was a great like nod to Harvey Milk's life and a great. <laughs> like send up to the Castro district in San Francisco like thousands of extras in this movie volunteered for free just because they wanted to help and be a part of it so a lot of neat stuff like that it's a really great film too nominated for a slew of Academy oh, Awards yeah. we talked about you know Sean Penn winning for best mm-hmm. actor uh, Dustin Lance Black won for original screenplay but mm-hmm. it was also nominated for best picture best supporting actor for Josh Brolin best director Gus Van Zandt best editing best costume design best achievement in music written for motion picture original Dang. score um, it's just, it's very great. I mean, I also find it funny that uh, Sean Penn broke his man kissing hymen on kissing James Franco. Mm. Well, good, good on them for that. I mean, both very talented guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, if anything, I would have liked more uh, James Franco in the movie. Yeah. But I mean, you know, obviously he can't really change history that yeah. much. Can't, can't win them all. No. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a very solid film. It's, it is. It's, it's very though interesting to see that difference in terms of that theme, like so year. much more comedic yeah. versus goofy stoner so much comedy, uh, gay political biopic. Like that's quite different. Yeah, keep, keep it, keep <laughs> yep. it keeping it, keeping it real. But then, flipping around, man, he goes right into the hardcore. Yeah, I mean, he he even builds upon, like, the momentum of Milk, mm-hmm. and then he goes on to do 127 Hours. Yes. Which is a story Ooh. of, what's his name? Uh, Aaron Ralston. Aaron Ralston, yes, who got trapped while out hiking. Mm-hmm. He got trapped with his arm under a boulder. And, yep. Uh, ended Blue up, John Canyon. Ended up having to do some really... Uh, 
tough things to survive, oh. so to speak. When this was shown in theaters, they there were actually people who had a medical emergencies during the amputation scene. Like, I, w- I mean, I would out. say it was probably one of the most visceral reactions oh. I've ever had to film. And yeah, we, like was, even more than like Unchien Andalu, the old Salvador Dali movie where he like slices the eyeball in half with yeah. a razor blade. Like even more than yeah, that, I was this, like, I mean, it, it took like minutes too. It was yeah. not a quick thing. No, it was. Not. It, I mean, it was. I mean, a you're you're cutting off a one, which is always going to be a tough yes. thing. But B, I the mean, it was shot and edited like. The, it went, yeah, it was trying to. But also, Danny Boyle, man, god damn. It's 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 such a. I mean. It's one of those films that, like, we've done a top five list on this mm-hmm. podcast where it's like top five films you would never want to watch again. This one <laughs> yeah. would definitely be on there for oh. me because it's just so painful to watch because I think it I would watch it up to that so point real. and I would want to fast forward and then continue watching the rest of the film. And then it was funny because I even got, like, I completely uh, freaked out when he has to drink out of that rancid pool oh. after it. I was like, oh, no, don't, don't. Uh, uh, yeah. Like, it was just, it was like, I was like ready to vomit uh-huh. after this movie. It, it really definitely shit. But I, at the same time, like, I, Totally thought he should have won Best Actor for Oh, yeah. Like, well, I mean, it, for the moment when Aaron falls down the canyon and gets his arm stuck under the rock, that, that you know, initial bit, uh, Danny Boyle filmed James Franco for just 20 minutes straight going through a whole plethora of emotions that he could come up with. Like, 20 minutes of footage. And then he edited it together to how it looked in the film. Well, I remember uh, I went to a screen where Danny Boyle actually was there mm. and they're talking to him about it. And they're saying things like, you know, uh, or saying that he had... Like, his arm attached under a rock, and they're mm. saying, like, uh, move it. Try and move it. Your best to move it. E- not telling him that they had, like, a bolt through the rock, so there's no way he was oh, going to be able to move it. And, like, when you actually see him struggling to get out, like, that is actually James Franco struggling uh, to get out. Yeah, he like, said he had, like, textbooks in the canyon with him so that he wouldn't get claustrophobic between cuts because they would keep him down in there for so long. So yes. he would, cause James Franco is a crazy academic, so he would be like, "Oh, we're on cut. Let's read this book. I'm reading this book. I'm reading this book. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not thinking about it." Yeah, no, it's it it real. It feels so real that it's 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 so tough to watch. I mean, and, and there's some interesting stuff about this film. I, like the fact that Aaron Ralston filmed this daily video diary when he was stuck, just like they show in the film. The footage has only been shown to close friends and family, and is kept in a bank vault for safety. <laughs> Before shooting began, James Franco and Danny Boyle got permission to watch it. I'll, I'll one-up you on that. One of the other things that I revealed was the camera he uses to shoot yep. those in it was the same one Aaron yep. Ralston had Got used. Got that on here, too. That's yep. crazy. The same exact, not just the same brand like no. they bought, but the actual same camcorder that he used. Yeah. yeah. And and actually, that's one of the most tough things to watch are those video, video diaries he does oh. during the movie. They're just so brutal and yeah. depressing. That it's, and, it's and, and if this gives you any idea how nuts in real life that boulder was, it took 13 men, a winch, and a hydraulic jack to lift the boulder high enough to retrieve his arm from the canyon. Yeah. Which he scattered the ashes of over the boulder on, I think, with Tom Brokaw. I don't even know if I'd want it at that point. Like, I don't know. Like, I kind of want to. Why do you think he scattered the ashes? Like, I don't want the shit. I, I would kind of want to be like, I don't even want to think about oh, that. Yeah. I don't want Like, we're, we can move on. Like, yeah. let's just leave it there. Oof. Like, uh, Oof. It's so brutal. But I mean, you know, it's not made for best picture, best actor. Let's see. Uh, best adapted screenplay, best editing, oh, best it. original best score, best original song. More of that AR Rahman stuff from. Mm. Um, uh, what was that film he did before this? Um, Jive Ho. Um, oh. Um, Slumdog Millionaire. Yes, Slumdog thank Millionaire. You. So like he carried a lot of that over. I think probably in some ways maybe the recency of that all winning so many awards might have hurt this film in probably. terms of rewarding yeah. it again. But but I th- man, I, th- I honestly like I, one of the things outside the visceral nature of this movie. I th- I simply think that this might be one of the most creatively and interestingly edited movies I've seen yeah. in a long number of years. Oh yeah, it's just so like. You think about the original story, and you're like, okay, how are they going to make a whole movie out of that? Like, obviously it's going to be interesting, but how are they going to make it not be boring? And the editing just totally, for me, makes the film. And Aaron Ralston was really very skeptical about them doing a yes. fictional version of it. Like, he wanted, he thought initially about doing a documentary. Mm-hmm. And he but, pretty much has said that it might as well have be a documentary with how real and honest it was yeah, to us. So to, good on him for that. Yeah, which is really awesome for... To, I love making... If you can make a fucking fictional tale of a real thing and have it be so real the person who went through it is like crying yeah you did good yeah you done did good 
But go in back in the opposite direction just a year later. As we were saying, on the other side of that Apatow-esque curve. Yeah, which is funny because it's the same director as um, Pineapple Express. Okay, yes. We have Your Highness, yes. which is the Danny McBride uh, mm -hmm. story with him as sort of uh, knights. Prince who gets stoned and fights dragons. But uh, they're they're on the quest to retrieve yes. James Franco's love, played by Zoe Dashnell. Yes, uh, along the way they run into um, Natalie Portman, yes. who becomes the love interest of Danny McBride. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's it is basically a stoner medieval action movie. This movie could have been really really funny, but you know what was sad about this movie? I was pretty excited about to see this movie. Five minutes into this movie, you could tell it was not going to be very good at all. It's not even like it went in a way and then it started being bad. It was like really early on. I gotta admit, like when I saw the trailer, I was like, "This looks dumb." Oh, like, it totally looked dumb. But it also, I thought it looked dumb in a way that like a lot of Will Ferrell movies go, where it can it can tick either way. It might be so dumb it's funny, or it might just be stupid. Just the, the notion of doing like a stoner, a stoner. Um, Medieval Night? story. Yeah, yeah, like just I was just like, this does not make any sense and to it, me. And it totally like it totally makes sense that most of the movie is improvised and yes. there wasn't much of a script and it was made because Danny McBride and his friend have this competition where they would give each other uh, a challenge and the challenge was to make a movie about a stone prince who fights dragons. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of reasons it's bad. But I think it's interesting to note, as I mentioned before, that James Franco's a crazy academic. Like, James Franco, even though this movie isn't that great, like, dude is nuts. Because <laughs> during filming, he flew back and forth between New York and Belfast because he was attending full-time classes at the university where he got a master's. Yeah, you know, at the same time, though, like, if you've ever watched, like, stuff online, like, there are tons of photos that would come of him, like, sleeping in class. Who doesn't which, sleep in class? Which is understandable, but come on, man. Like, <laughs> But who doesn't sleep in class? You still have to pass tests. You still have to do the work. I, I never fell asleep in class. I can say you that. You never fell asleep in class? No. Jesus, Spencer. You yeah. know, I fell asleep so bad I had a... I in skipped, the front row of a lecture I've hall. i plenty of classes, but... I fell asleep so bad front middle of a lecture hall that the professor tapped a pen next to my head and when I sat up he said you were snoring and then went back to his lecture um, but no on top of the fact that he's going back and forth it's not just that okay he's going back and forth he's filming a movie he's sleeping through classes whatever you want to call it but during and before and during the filming for nine months he practiced sword play as well I mean, it's not like he's give, only filming and I'll going to class. I'll Dude's give, working I'll his give, ass off. I'll give him respect for that, but here's the flip side. Falling asleep during class, mm -hmm. and the one nomination this film had Razzie? was James Franco, <laughs> worst supporting actor, Razzie. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He, okay, so maybe he phoned it in. But <laughs> phoned both of them in. Like, that's my point. Like, he got a degree. Not phoned maybe, that one in. Maybe less is more, is all I'm saying. Like, focus on one and then okay. the other, not trying to yes, do both at the yes, same time. Yes, the work he's done with said degree and the, the no, some of the academic work he's done is not the best, and some of his critique is not the greatest. And I know there's Brandy out there in specific, and and I have some problems with some of the things he said. But still, I just I, I find some of that stuff impressive, even if you're phoning in a crappy movie that you're also taking was, all that time. Was it this like the same year that he did the shitty Oscars? This was 2011 oh, with Anne Hathaway. Yeah, probably. So not I mean, a good not a good year for you, Franco. Not yeah, a good year. Not, uh, yeah, I mean, fortunately, you bounced back though. You you bounced back in a big way. Yeah. We're talking a film that came out in August, which I thought was going to be terrible oh, yeah. before I which saw it. It's never a good month. And I thought it was going to be a bad movie yeah. as well. And that is Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Surprisingly really good. Yes, this is sort of a reboot mm -hmm. of the um, Planet of the Apes Probably franchise. the best Planet of the Apes since the originals. I would say it's the best, if you ask me. Like, I, I thought the originals were fine, but they feel very dated to me. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, I would say outside maybe the first Planet of the Apes, based on its creativity and the ingenuity of it, this is probably the best one. It's also a reimagining. I mean, the original ones were just like a, a more of an evolution of mm -hmm. the apes or humans to apes, sort yeah. of. Whereas this, they actually were engineered on accident in mm -hmm. a laboratory setting. It's true. Which, with James Franco trying to, was it cure Alzheimer's yeah. or something, I believe. Yeah. And, it's, were, and it's also not like a weird sci fi -y future as much as it is present yeah, day. I believe. I mean, it's as, totally something that seems prequel. plausible. I yeah. mean, it seems like they're working on a drug to improve. Um, brain slash memory mm -hmm. function, and they're testing on animals. I mean, theoretically, you would think if it does improve brain function, who knows what could happen? Yep. And so, I mean, they keep a lot of nods to the original as well. Oh, like there's they have, so many. The, the ape is named Caesar. Uh -huh. um, the scene where he says no, 
uh -huh. is such a powerful one as it is in the previous yeah. movies. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, there's so many little nods all over the place. Charlton Heston's seen on screen, and every it, like the fifth time his he appears in a movie that he's a uh, Planet of the Apes movie that he's not actually starring in, just mm -hmm. as like a cameo thing. Um, I think it's interesting to note because the special effects for this movie were really well done. Andy Serkis. Huge, huge surprise. That was one of the things I feared the yep. most was, I mean, the original ones, I mean, obviously had done with actors mm -hmm. and costumes. This is the first one that had the CGI rather than the yeah. actors and makeup. And it was always Even like... the Tim Burton one had people in makeup. Yeah, it, it was like, is this going to be able to recreate sort of that ape feel that the previous ones had done? And boy, did it yeah. ever Yeah, Andy Serkis knocked it out the park. And also, I think it's, this is interesting because this is something you don't think about very often. This is one of the first feature films to use mocap on location, mm. where they didn't just have the standard green screen studio grid set up to get mocap. They actually would have sets or locations and then people with mocap suits mm. acting within it, which I think cool. says a lot for where, how far mocap has come. If only Robert Zemeckis would maybe learn a little bit from it. Well, I think he's, he's moving <laughs> on to do other stuff. Stuff. So yeah, that's, that's that just period. Let's move unless on he to makes a sequel of uh, Roger Rabbit. Uh. <laughs> well, you don't want the Polar Express too. No, Electric Boogaloo. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. Um, another thing I think is just neat because you know this film is really I think has some really cool uh, symbol symbolism in it and neat kind of metaphors and, mm. and cool statements for a series that became such or in the original series kind of became just camp sci-fi classic. Sure. Um, after the apes have run rampant during in San Francisco at the end, Caesar, Maurice, Buck, and Rocket are you know shown on the co ro uh, trolley car as it rides mm -hmm. over the hill into the sunset. Uh, not only are they the four leaders of the ape rebellion, but interestingly enough, they're a representation of the four different dominant ape species: uh, chimpanzee, orangutan, gorilla, and bonobo. That's very cool. Yeah, they're all shown in unity and uh, standing upright and. Uh, rising up into the sunset, giving an interesting extra connotation to the film's title. I'm, I'm looking very much forward to the sequel. Was it Dawn mm -hmm. of the Planet of the Apes? Yeah. That they've got more because I think they I think, just uh, got Gary Oldman. Yeah, Gary Oldman just, just, yeah, just signed on. I mean, I, I, I'm very much looking forward to it. It's, it's, it can continue on this sort of feel very much. It'll be awesome. And I mean, it was great to see this was nominated for visual effects because it was a very pleasant surprise. Yes. Usually August is a dumping ground. Uh -huh. So it was a total surprise that this was as entertaining as it was. Original ending, James Franco died. Mm. Yeah. Spoilers for those who've seen it or haven't seen it. He lives, um, <laughs> but he he died and actually like, I think a week or two before it was supposed to be released, like really early before it was supposed to be released, they changed their mind and uh, James Franco and Andy Serkis flew back to the studio over Fourth of July weekend to reshoot the new the ending that's actually in the film now. I also want to say uh, that. To build on your visual effects thing, mm -hmm. according to the Visual Effects Society Awards, which seems like it would probably be one of the best ones to win, yeah. it won for Outstanding Animated Character in a Live Action Motion Picture and Outstanding Visual Effects in a Visual Effects Driven Motion Picture. So wow. it seemed to win pretty much the biggest ones of all. So. Which is totally deserves, because yeah. I mean... The, my oh, I only have one gripe with this movie, and it's pretty amazing that I can only have one gripe with the movie because usually my gripe lists are pretty long, and that's mm. the monkey physics. I think we've spoken about this mm. before. There's just a lot of times where like monkeys jump out of buildings like three or four stories up and just land like no problem, and but that's really like it. That's like the only thing that otherwise it's very well done, very yeah. realistic. It's neat. I like it. I believe this is how we're gonna go down. If it's not the aliens, it's gonna be the monkeys. Maybe it'd be alien monkeys. Don't, 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 Face huggers don't, and chimpanzees and don't gorillas. Throw, don't throw that out there. <laughs> Xenomorph don't give them gorillas. Ideas. Don't give them ideas. <laughs> uh, that brings us to this Friday, mm -hmm. March 8th. We're talking Oz the Great and Powerful. Yes. This is a reteaming of James Franco with Sam Raimi. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Spider Man cred represent. Yeah. This is a. What, Mila Kunis? Mila Kunis, uh, Michelle Williams. And Rachel Weiss. Rachel Weiss. Mm -hmm. This is Zach Braff's in there as well. Huh, um, probably a voice. I think he's the voice of the monkey. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of the. I mean, I, I guess I'm not an expert on the Oz You world. could call it a prequel as far as chronology. Is, is it a reimagining, though? Um, well, there's a lot of Oz books. Yeah, there's a lot. And a lot, mo some of them are prequel-ish and more about Oz himself. It, it definitely predates uh, Wizard of Oz. Because yes. this is about James Franco becoming yes, this Oz, is about right? Yeah, this is about the great wizard, um, whose name I can't remember right now, even though it was the name that... Ben Linus took originally in Lost, and that's why I always used to remember it, but the character of the, the charlatan wizard who gets sucked into Oz and then, you know, becomes the great wizard. 
I, I really like, there's two things I like so far about the seeing of this movie, even though I am very skeptical of it, and I'm hoping it's not going to be bad. I'm actually going to see it tomorrow, by the time, or today, by the time this comes out. Mm -hmm. um, is that I really enjoyed the way in the trailer they went from like the four boy four by three in black and white and then expanded yes. into the. It full looks very color. visually lush. I will yeah. get that. And I really enjoyed the fact that they're making it. I won't say secret, but not really obvious which of the witches becomes the the wicked witch, the green wicked witch that we know that we know of. Yeah, I don't know how secret it is. Well, that's why I said you know. It's not that it's secret, it's just that they're not making it incredibly, supremely, hugely obvious in the trailers right. or in the promotion where they're like, guess what? This is the Wicked Witch. And then there's these other characters. Just like, just from the casting, though, I, I mean, well, they, yeah. they sort of get an idea of which one they go with. I mean, for me, like, A, I'm not particularly thrilled that this is really being pushed with 3D. Yeah. Really not, not that excited to it. Yeah. Um, B, like, I don't know if the way they're just selling it really feels right. It, it just, yeah. it feels kind of I feel kind like of, kind of John Cartering their promotion for yeah. it, where they're trying to sell, I think, the wrong angle of it. They're trying to go much more Alice in Wonderland. Look, it's visually pretty in 3D. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And that movie was horrible. Yeah. So why don't you try I to go... It's a lot of money, I guess, but... <sighs> But I, I just wish they would might more like try to harken back to the Wizard of Oz caliber or just being a fun adventure film rather than a crazy special effects bonanza. But either way, I'll see it because yeah. my wife, uh, Wizard of Oz is her favorite movie of all time. Really? So it's, yeah, it's appropriate that we see this movie so she can be horribly let down. <laughs> yeah, and I'm also I'm, I'm not entirely sure about James Franco playing Oz. Like he's a very talented actor, mm -hmm. but there's just something that just doesn't feel like a right match mm. about it to me. Like. Yeah. I mean, maybe he'll surprise me. Yeah, may maybe Rami will, Rami will direct him in a proper way, and we'll all be pleasantly surprised, but maybe not. I don't know. Like, it's just, again, one of those things where it feels like we're taking another franchise and just trying to add a whole bunch of action to oh, it definitely. that I don't know if it necessarily yeah. fits with the story that we've yeah, got going on. exactly. Anyway, let us know your thoughts about James Franco, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, Join us next week for our DVD rundown mm -hmm. for the week of March 12th. Yeah. As always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes, yep. we're on Blip.tv, mm -hmm. we're on Miro, we're on Roku. Check in and get glue, get some stickers, some badges, whatever you want to call them. Leave some reviews on iTunes. Comment on YouTube. I'm finally starting to comment on there, yeah. so we'll you get me fold. trolling you on there. Yeah, and he trolls with the best of them, so watch out. I do. I'm a, I'm a pro troll. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Like, don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.